Father Bohdan Hladio here again at St. Volodymyr Ukrainian Orthodox Cathedral in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. And we are continuing our series of short films about the various aspects of the church and of the liturgy which the faithful normally wouldn't see or wouldn't have access to. This film is about the Holy Altar, the area on the east of the church, which is separated from the nave by the ikonostas, where the divine liturgy is celebrated. And so here we'll be talking about four particular things within the holy altar. One is the holy table itself, which we'll begin with. And then following this, we'll talk about the high place, which is behind the altar, the diakonikon, which is the table to the right of the altar as the priest stands in front, and the table of oblation, which is the table to the left where the gifts are prepared. And so often in English, we call this table the altar, but technically speaking, this whole area we call the altar, and this table is called the holy table. In it, if it's properly consecrated, are the relics of saints, little pieces of usually the bones of the saints in the holy altar, in the holy table, we usually place uh, the relics of martyrs because this is a tradition from apostolic times yet that they would serve the divine liturgy over the bones of the martyrs, of the bones of the saints. And often if one travels in Western Europe, you will even see entire altars that are built above the a tomb of a saint. So this is a very ancient tradition. This particular holy table is made of marble. We would also have holy tables traditionally made of wood. And the main thing that they have in common is that they're always constructed in a particular way and they always contain the relics. And so what do we have on the holy table? Always we would have the um, in Greek, it's called artophorion. In English, we normally say the tabernacle, and that's usually made in the form of a church or a stylized church where the holy gifts are reserved for the sick so that when someone becomes ill or is dying and has to be communed, the priest would come to the church, go into the tabernacle, take a particle of the holy body, which has been intincted with the holy blood, usually at the liturgy of Holy Thursday, and then he would take that and go to commune the faithful. So that is probably the most prominent thing in most churches that one would see on the holy table. The next is the Holy Gospel book. And again, this is not the Bible, this is the four gospels, that are read during the divine liturgy and during the other services. Always we would have a hand cross. Here we have two very beautiful hand crosses. As well, we would have the spear and the spoon, which are used, of course, in the distribution of Holy Communion, as well as the communion cloths. What we normally don't see is what is underneath the gospel book. And this is called the antimens or antimension. And antimension basically means in place of the stone, in place of the table. And what it is, is a cloth with an image of Jesus' burial. And as you can see, we have the Lord, we have his mother, the mirror-bearing women to a greater or lesser degree, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, St. John the theologian, and then on the sides, the icons of the holy evangelists and uh, the angels. There could be different artistic renderings of this. It's very similar to the shroud which is carried out on Good Friday and put in the middle of the church. And there are uh, firm indications that these two things were related. Also, 
in the Antimension, we have a sponge. And the sponge is used whenever we are putting the particles from the discos into the chalice to make sure that nothing, nothing, nothing remains on the discos so that all of the particles are placed into the chalice. The most important thing about the Antimension is the fact that it also has relics in it. So in churches, for example, where the altar has not been consecrated, also, if we were to do as many people are doing now because of the COVID crisis an outdoor liturgy somewhere outside of the walls of the church, we still serve the liturgy over the relics of the saints. And so you can see in this Antimension, the little pouch with the relic. And these Antimensia are consecrated by a bishop just like he would consecrate the holy table. Also very important for the um, Antimension, and these are the two most important things. One is that the relics are there. The other is that it is signed by the bishop. This is the bishop's blessing to the priest and the community in any parish that the priest and the community have the blessing of the bishop to serve the divine liturgy. Without the Antimension, the divine liturgy cannot be served. Even if we had relics, we still need the blessing of the bishop. And so this is why we see that the bishop always signs and he writes in for which parish, what date it was consecrated, and that he blesses this community to serve the divine liturgy. And we always see this within the um, antimension of any church, no matter where we go. One very important thing that is traditionally done is when a new bishop is given to a diocese, he consecrates new antimensia to give to all of the parishes so that there's a very clear spiritual bond between the bishop and all of the priests and all the parishes in his diocese. During the divine liturgy, the antimension is opened after the reading of the gospel. The priest returns to the altar, places the gospel book in front of the tabernacle, and then when in the litany of supplication, the priest commemorates the metropolitan and or bishop, at that point he would open three sides of the antimension. Again, we pray for his eminence, our metropolitan Yuri, and for his grace, our bishop Andri. And it would remain that way he will finish opening it up either during the litany for the catechumens at the exclamation that you may reveal, that to them may be revealed the gospel of truth, and he would open it then. But if the litany of the catechumens is not done, then it is opened up at the litany for the faithful. Again and again, let us, the faithful, pray unto the Lord, and he would open it then. And then at the exclamation at the end of the litany, for unto you are due all glory, honor, and worship to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages, amen. He would take the um, sponge, and he would kiss it and place it off to the side. In addition to the antimension, the gospel, the cross, the spoon and spear for the Holy Communion, and the tabernacle. Usually we will have oil lamps and or candles that are put on the holy table. In this case, we have the triple and double candles of the bishop because this is a cathedral parish. And then behind the tabernacle or behind the holy table, it's very common to have the seven branched candlestick, which is reminiscent of both the Old Testament temple as well as the new church in the regeneration, which we read about in the book of Revelation. On either side of the seven branch candlestick, there are the ripidia or fans and 
Often the fans will be used in procession to cover the gifts, the chalice, the discos, or the gospel, and the fans are essentially a way of showing honor. Just like when we sense something, we are showing honor. When we put the fans above something, or when, for example, we fan the gifts at the consecration of the liturgy, this is a way of showing honor. And lastly, we usually will have behind the holy table a processional cross. And this cross, whenever we make church processions, especially when we go outdoors, will be usually in the front of the procession and leading the procession. So this is the holy table. And now we will proceed to talk about and see the high place, which is behind the holy table, as well as the diaconicon and the table of oblation. As we know, churches traditionally were oriented. That is, they faced the east, the orient. And so for that reason, no matter which way our churches are really facing, whether east, south, north, west, whatever, we always call the altar area the east. And so the east wall behind the holy table is called the high place. And there are several reasons for this. We normally would build churches facing east because we believe that that's where Christ will return from. Christ will return from the east. Like the sun rises in the east, the sun will return from the east. And we have usually, if we're in a beautiful church like this, a throne where the bishop would normally sit. And so the first thing we notice is that behind the bishop's seat is an icon of Christ, but Christ dressed as a bishop. And this reminds us, and it reminds the bishop, that the bishop should be the image of Christ, as we all should be the image of Christ. Likewise, the bishop especially should be the image of Christ, and that there is actually only one priest, and that is Christ, and all ministry in the church is Christ's ministry. So anything we do as Christians, we do in the name of Christ. So this throne is where the bishop would normally sit. And in the older churches, if we go to um, Constantinople or Greece or in any ancient church, normally you will see here what is called the synthronon where there are a series of steps. Here we see only one step. It's raised one step above the uh, floor. But there is a series of steps, and the bishop's throne might actually, he might be sitting, you know, this high, okay? And then around him, like we have here on both sides, little benches where the priests would sit. And so you have Christ and the apostles. You have the bishop with his priests, his counselors. And... This is where they normally come, if you notice in the Divine Liturgy, at the reading of the Epistle, after, during the uh, singing of the Holy God, Sviate Bože, the clerics come to the back and they hear the reading of the Holy Epistle from here. And if there is a deacon serving and the bishop is here, the bishop hears the reading of the Holy Gospel from here. And so the high place is very important for us both symbolically reminding us that Christ is coming again and he'll come from the east, reminding us that the bishop sits in the place of Christ to represent Christ to us. And this is one of the holiest places where when the clergy are serving and we actually face to face see the people because it's very, very meaningful that during the service, whether it be a bishop or a priest, whoever is presiding, has two functions. One function is to represent the people to God, and the other function is to represent God to the people. And so this is why not only the holy table, but also the high, high place, are very important and meaningful aspects of 
the holy altar. Now we will proceed to the diaconicon. To the ecclesiastical south of the holy table, in other words, when the priest is in front of the holy table to his right, is a table called the diaconicon, usually on, against the wall like it is here. And basically, it is simply just a side table that could be used for various purposes. Here, you see the plaschanitsya, the holy shroud, the epitaphion, which is brought out on Holy Friday. And sometimes the epitaphion is kept, you know, in a frame on a wall or somewhere else. There could be vestments here. There could be other things. So it's really sort of a side table that can be used for various uses. We have an icon here of Melchizedek, uh, the king of Salem, from the Genesis account, who um, met the patriarch Abraham, to whom Abraham gave tithes. Melchizedek brought bread and wine, and of course Melchizedek is seen as a prefiguration of Jesus Christ. So the diaconicon, this side table, is basically just a table that is in the altar, where, which can um, fulfill various uses. In older, larger churches, it would have been a whole room, and what we would now call a vestry. So sometimes you can go to Greece or to the Middle East and you see an old church and the room to the right of the altar, that's where they would have vestments and all kinds of things. In our churches, mostly because they're smaller, the diaconicon is simply a table in the altar that is used as needed for various purposes. Now we'll move on to the uh, table of oblation. And finally, we come to the table of oblation or proskomedinic. It is found to the ecclesiastical north of the holy table, that is, to the left of the priest as he's standing at the holy table. And this is the table used for the preparation of the gifts, called in Greek either prothesis or proskomidi. And what we see is the chalice, the discos, the star cover, the spoon, the spear, a cutting board, the covers for the holy chalice, the discos, as well as the cruets for the water and the wine. And as you can see on one of our other films, this is where the priest prepares the bread and the wine, which will become the body and blood of our Lord during the divine liturgy. Thank you for watching. May God bless and keep you. Spasivas hospodi.